and welcome to Are We There Yet? Market Scale's online video podcast series where we explore the most exciting cutting edge things happening in transportation today. And I'm really excited today for the opportunity to speak with the company behind the hottest hypercar in the market today, Zinger Vehicles. And here today to speak with us about Zinger is the founder and chief executive officer, Kevin Zinger, and the co-founder and chief operating officer, Lucas Zinger. Kevin, Lucas, hello, and welcome to Are We There Yet? Hi, Grant. It's our pleasure to be here. Well, thank Hi, you. Hi, Grant. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your uh, busy schedule. Although, uh, if if you drove in uh, today in the 21C, I, I imagine it was a pretty quick commute. But but I, I am confident the 21C is is the hottest hypercar in the market today. And I'm so excited to learn a little bit more about that. Some of the other vehicles within your lineup, and really kind of jump into learning a little bit more about Zinger Vehicles. Um, what what I believe is the the hottest, most exciting company in the industry. And so as I uh, understand um, Zinger Vehicles, you're you're really an industry disrupting performance vehicle brand. You're you're truly pioneering a uh, new era in the automotive uh, space. Uh, you're fundamentally changing the way that cars are designed and manufactured. And uh, I, I understand that this is really going to be what I what I think is the next chapter of automotive manufacturing for really generations to come. So I uh, really appreciate everything you've done with the company and for taking time to talk a little bit more about it today. Um, I'd love to, to jump right into the, the 21C. And uh, the 21C is such an incredible vehicle. Um, Motor Trend described it as leaving no question that it is a hypercar. Um, it offers that four-figure uh, horsepower lab record, uh, lap record shattering performance, um, the vehicle appearance and sheer presence, I think in Motor Trend's words, uh, reflexively slackened Motor Trend's jaws. And so it's an incredible looking vehicle and uh, track records uh, that, that have demonstrated the brands or performance are just incredible. And uh, I know that there's a lot of car enthusiasts within the audience uh, today. And so for those that want to hear more about the specs, zero to 62 miles per hour in less than two seconds, a top speed of 253 miles per hour. Um, but what I'm really excited about is impressive as, as all of this is, and it is, I understand that, that really your grand vision goes much uh, beyond this. And so I can't wait to learn a little bit more about that. But but first, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love maybe hearing a little bit more about maybe the performance and the specs of the 21C. Do you mind maybe telling us a little bit more, you know, first about this incredible car that you've developed? Lucas? Absolutely. So as you said, you know, we, we certainly feel this is now the pinnacle of performance and setting a new benchmark in the hypercar class. And when we set out, um, and we'll get deeper into it, we had a new technology base to, to work with, and that was a technology base that we actually created. And having that new technology base, we said, we're going to make the ultimate vehicle. And the ultimate vehicle for us was really a vehicle that would shatter performance across all the most meaningful metrics. And for us, a lot of those metrics were true car performance around a track, zero to 60, quarter mile, zero to 400 to zero, and a lot of those come down to your aerodynamics, your power delivery, and your power to weight ratio. So uh, top line specs for the 21C, as you said, uh, horsepower in, in kind of the four digits there, uh, 1350 total horsepower, 1250 uh, kilogram dry weight, so better than one to one power to weight, zero to 60 in just 1.88 seconds, and the quarter mile in just about eight seconds flat. Wow, wow. That's incredible. Those are some some serious specs. Um, yeah. And what I think is really interesting too is that you know the twenty one C it it's not your first hypercar. Um, you you introduced the blade um, through Divergent, as I understand, back in two thousand fifteen, and that kind of led was kind of a starting point to the twenty one uh, C, and uh, then then came out with the twenty one C, the twenty one um, C V Max, and um, are, are starting to kind of hint a little bit uh, to some of the exciting things uh, about the Hyper GT. For example, um, I'd love, um, you know, before learning a little bit more about the, the company and, and, and Divergent and just kind of how a lot of this came together. And I can't wait to jump into that. But but I'm so intrigued by, by the models. Do you, do you mind maybe talking a little bit about kind of that evolution from uh, the Blade to, you know, where you are today with the Hyper GT? Sure. So, you know, as Lucas said, uh, the team that created the car first created a set of digital tools. And really the first set of tools that used supercomputing and additive manufacturing and automation to allow you to 
express ideas about how to create performance in a way that's never been possible before. And the first car that we did, the Blade, uh, was really uh, a laboratory. That was not intended to be a vehicle that would be fully homologated and sold to customers. It was really the test bed for saying, if you have these tools, how can you express the ideas you have in performance and design and what type of structures a vehicle would have? And so that that was really uh, you know, the initial rationale for creating the Blade vehicle. And then from there, once we saw that if you have these tools, you can create a totally different organizational structure for a company, you can create totally different business model and economics. You know, then, you know, once we knew that, Lucas and I founded uh, Zinger Vehicles and brought out the 21C. Very good. Very good. Develop, develop the tools and then kind of gotten into the models. That's incredible. Why, why, why was there a need to, to develop uh, tools um, uh, you know, versus what's, what's been done traditionally? Can you tell us a little bit more about kind of the origin of identifying there, there, there's got to be a new set of tools and, and is really a need for it as we continue to kind of evolve within the industry? Sure. So, uh, you know, in different ways, Lucas and I have been involved in uh, the scale production of cars going back to, uh, you know, my co-founding an EV car company and an EV battery design manufacturing company as joint ventures in China around 2006. Lucas actually worked on a factory floor of uh, the car company in Northeast uh, China back around 2010. And when you're looking at how cars are manufactured, even today, whether it's Toyota or Tesla, the same basic manufacturing technology that was created 100 years ago, taking a piece of sheet steel or aluminum and basically stamping that two-dimensional piece of sheet steel into something that's three-dimensional and then fixturing it on an assembly line and welding one piece to the next piece, going to the next station, doing the same thing, that's 100 years old. That is fundamentally analog manufacturing. Yeah. You look at today, you know, we have all of this computing power. We looked at that and said, rather than look at taking that manufacturing typewriter and trying to digitize it the way that IBM tried to digitize the typewriter in the 1970s and added two lines of memory. Yeah. Instead, mm -hmm. create Mac desktop publishing cars. And okay. about 600 patents or so later, we have a full system. You know, I started out as the lead inventor in the company. Lucas is the lead inventor on the automation side. So between us, we probably have about a fifth of the, you know, 550, 600 uh, patents. But that was really the core of it. It was looking and saying, Content moved from analog to digital. The physical world needs to as well for economic and environmental and creative reasons. And we can be the catalyst for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Incredible. What a great analogy too. Let's, let's forget digitizing the typewriter and just, just jump right to the Mac. So, so that's amazing. So you, you created those tools and kind of within that created the blade and that was kind of that for that stepping stone leading to the 21c uh 21c v max where you are today and now kind of you know moving to to that hyper gt would you mind kind of um kind of you know continuing within that process to to where you are you know today um how how are some of those kind of tools um you know really applied to kind of this next evolution the uh the hyper gt you mind maybe telling us a little bit more about that model of course, of course. So as you said, and, and kind of depicted accurately, uh, and Kevin did as well, the Blade was um, really a technology development tool for uh, generating what we call that production system DAPs, the design software, the added manufacturing assembly. The 21C um, is a fully road homologated, crash tested, uh, you know, end customer vehicle. And the VMAX is a variant of the 21C. The VMAX is uh, you could say a longer tail body form, a more 
um, slippery body overall, so less downforce, um, has a higher top speed, and it's a bit more of a um, GT spec than a pure track beast like the 21C is. Uh, the Hyper GT for us is really a nod to the future. So it's showing where's thing your vehicle's going. Uh, it's a concept vehicle for us that is packaged and designed, but it shows that using the same set of tools, we can make a very diverse portfolio of vehicles. And that's really what differentiates us from other car makers as well, is typically in automotive, you're trying to share as much content as you can across your vehicles. And that's what you call a platform model. And that's how you uh, can really amortize your investment the best. And you actually end up sharing a chassis for your supercar and your GT car, and even sometimes your you know, two plus two coupe. Uh, all of those cars might sit on the same chassis. So uh, in the end, you're actually not reaching the pinnacle of performance for each one of those vehicles. For us at Zinger Vehicles, uh, we've got a new set of tools which really allows us to create unique designs that are completely optimized for that specific vehicle from the ground up. Uh, and that's really what the Hyper uh, GT shows as well as a brand new chassis architecture, brand new powertrain uh, architecture as well, and brand new vehicle developed by you know this young brand as a technology leader and showing that, hey, we don't need a platform share. We don't need to cut corners here. Uh, or really sacrifice performance, we can create segment-defining vehicles, and that's what we're about. That's really interesting to me, and and these vehicles are just just in, in incredible per performance vehicles. Do you see, you know, application uh, of these tools that you've developed uh, into, you know, other other vehicle segments, uh, for example, and whether that's through you know your organizations or through you know partnerships, collaborations with other auto manufacturers, does it does it apply to you know uh, totally different other other vehicle segments as well? Yes. So I mean, on the technology company side with Divergent, mm -hmm. uh, we now have uh, six major OEM brands that we work with. It's already been announced that we're working with. Uh, Aston Martin, Lucas was just at their uh, assembly line uh, a couple of weeks ago, seeing the first of our rear frames being uh, uh, assembled as part of customer cars for delivery this year. Uh, you know, those uh, uh, initial customers range from the Aston Martins to the Mercedes, but the idea is over time, this is a technology which will fundamentally replace analog design manufacturing uh, and uh, assembly. And you know that's really our ultimate uh, objective. Yeah. And I'd say you know, this, this is a technology and, and we call it an adaptive system for a reason that's not gonna become stale. It's gonna continue to adapt and to continue to adapt it requires something pushing that adaptation. And I'd say Zinger Vehicles is pushing that. It's really a technology partner to Divergent, and it's coming up with these new system designs and constantly pushing the boundaries of what that system can create. And that sort of relationship between the two companies is, uh, I think, very, very beneficial from everything from creating IP to new products that eventually you'll find in uh, you know, other OEMs vehicles, but Zinger will always be at that. Uh, leading edge and really demonstrating to to the industry what is new and what is better. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. I'd I'd love to learn a little bit more uh, about that about the 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 company. So Divergent and of course Singer Vehicles, and you've mentioned too some of the other partnerships. But you know, for the audience members that maybe aren't so familiar um, with kind of that that structure and 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 the companies uh, that you've founded uh, within development of, of these tools and, and vehicles. Do you mind maybe introducing us a little bit more to kind of maybe each company, Zinger and, and Divergent, and kind of the relationship between the, the two organizations within, you know, what, what you've shared with us? Sure. I mean, Divergent and Zinger vehicles are, uh, they're family-related uh, companies. Yeah. Uh, like Lucas and I are, are related <laughs> in that, Divergent is the 70% plus owner of Zinger Vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the founder of, uh, of Divergent. Lucas and I are co-founders of Zinger Vehicles. I started the company Divergent going back to 2014 with that idea that uh, Lucas and I 
when we were building EVs, mm -hmm. looked and said, people are talking about things like industry 4.0 and digitization within automotive. Mm -hmm. But once again, it was really trying to digitize the typewriter, not thinking from a clean sheet of paper. And so that company was founded to do that. And, you know, Zinger, as Lucas said, and Divergent, they were designed to be complementary. One's designed to be the tools. Then you use those tools to express new products, new architecture, and beyond that cutting edge. And that in turn feeds back into the improvement of those tools. Mm -hmm. Then once again, allowing or enabling the team at Zinger to be even more creative in the way that they design, the way that they integrate different structures, the performance that's gained, the type of vehicle niches you go in. I mean, there's a reason it's called vehicles and not just cars. Mm -hmm. I think over time, you know, we will become more and more uh, creative in what we do. Uh, the Divergent Company has raised to date over $500 million. The companies together, they're both located in the same building uh, in Los Angeles. It's both uh, uh, a research and development facility and an actual production uh, and testing facility. So everybody is under that one roof, it's about 300 employees, primarily uh, engineers and uh, scientists that uh, Lucas and I lead and uh, uh, and manage. The first five years of the company were really inventing that system and exploring that architecture through Divergent and Singer vehicles. Now Divergent is in the commercialization stage. We've not only started to commercially scale. And respectfully, I think we're a decade or more ahead of where people thought additive manufacturing or digital design and manufacturing would be. And we're starting to scale now with major companies. On the Zinger side, the 21C, which will be you know, fully uh, crash homologated vehicle, uh, full compliance with California Air Resource Board's most uh, uh, stringent uh, uh, pollution, air pollution regulations, that car will be in customer hands this year. And so, you know, we're now in the commercialization stage. In addition, I would say on the divergent side, uh, General Atomics, which is the largest defense drone maker for the United States, announced that they have multiple production programs with us. And just to give you an idea is how disruptive this technology can be, across many different segments. You know, we took a, a couple meter long fuselage for a drone mm -hmm. and we reduced the number of parts from over 140 down to four by splitting the fuselage into four sections and then printing in the fuel tanks, printing into the skin, heat exchangers, bracketry and other things. This wow. completely changes architecture, performance, mass, time to production, number of suppliers, completely transforms what you're doing. It, it is the kind of transformation that we've seen in content, you know, going from analog to digital over the last 30, 40 years. We're mm -hmm. about to see it in this, you know, objects world of atoms as it goes from analog design, manufacturing and assembly to full digital design, manufacturing, and, uh, and assembly. Wow, that's amazing. Do, is the industry there, I mean, I, it sounds like you've kind of answered this a little bit just with the incredible amount of investment and the partnerships and not even limited to, to, to vehicles, some of the other applications within transportation and mobility, drones, as you mentioned, for, for example. Does, is transportation mobility kind of as a whole or some of the industries within that, are, are, are they you know, there yet in terms of recognizing, okay, you know, we've been doing things kind of this analog way we need to um, you know, evolve to the more digital way, the way that, that you're advocating, the tools that you develop, the vehicles uh, that, that you've developed and are, and are commercializing now. Is, is, are, are these 
kind of supporting industries, verticals, transportation, mobility as a whole? Are they with you in terms of recognizing that, uh, you know, they need to move kind of that beyond that old way of doing things? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the cat's out of the bag in terms of what digital manufacturing is and that it's going to be the future. Um, I think in the last 18 months, we really saw almost every one of the large OEMs and OEM groups come on board with that vision. And, you know, Kevin and I were in Europe for the last two weeks um, and we met with about eight different CEO and CTO groups across all the big OEMs. Um, Mm -hmm. They all understand this vision. They all know it's going to happen. The difference between them is just what pace are they integrating that technology at and, you know, what is their risk profile and what is their appetite. But I'd say 10 years from now, everyone's going to be using this production method and design method. uh, Mm -hmm. And who's going to be a leader and first adopter? Um, We're already seeing signs of that, right? Aston Martin as our first customer, Mercedes and others uh, picking up very quickly. And I'd say some of the U.S. OEMs uh, really starting to get the picture as well. Yeah, that's great. Great to hear. Great to hear that they're 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 there or getting there. It sounds like so that yeah that's awesome yeah. I'd say when when we started, you know, the, the company is about seven years old, and we probably started talking to our first customers about five years ago. Um, there was much more hesitation. I think you know the general um, vision was so far ahead of the current technology picture, um, and we hadn't scaled yet to a real proof point. Um, that at that point, there was more friction in those conversations. But really, in the last 18 months, we have such a large data set. We've got the Zinger car running and having passed crash with flying colors. We've got vehicles with OEMs that have gone through full crash. We're delivering structures every day. Uh, it's simply something you can prove by hosting a, a visit to our facility at this point. Yeah, no kidding. Is, is y'all shared? I mean, you, you've moved just so quickly, and I think that's probably um, a lot of the reasoning, kind of testament to why you know others are get are really getting it now. I mean, you've really demonstrated it, you know, uh, through the tools you developed with Divergent, and and now kind of commercializing it and and showing the power of it through through Zinger. So that's incredible. Um, w- w- within these tools and 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 systems, and kind of this evolution to the digital age of of manufacturing and assembly, as you shared, you're, you're really taking advantage of you know a lot. Of, of really incredible technologies and tools and kind of bringing a lot of that together within within now your tools and, and process. And so, you know, you've touched on a little bit, you know, integrating, you know, AI technologies, 3D printing, um, you know, uh, the latest in additive manufacturing, for example, supercomputing um, and, and doing a, a lot of this too, while, you know, it, it's also a more in, in environmentally conscious a, a approach to it as well. So it's really bringing in just, uh, you know, a, a lot of different kind of technologies and, and methodologies. Do you mind maybe just touching on a little of those areas? I mean, I find, for example, like the 3D printing component to be, you know, really fascinating. But, you know, within kind of your tools and processes, the 3D printing, the AI kind of supercomputing, bringing some of those areas together, you mind maybe just kind of high level touching on some of those, um, you know, areas within the the tools now that, that, that you offer? Sure. I, I'd say the fundamental principle that has allowed us to get to this point has been, you know, a systems approach to things, which is, you know, if you want to build a system, you can't go out and say what exists out there and how do I bolt it together into something, right? Because what exists out there is there to digitize the typewriter. So you needed to create a new architecture and you needed to be ready to invent a full system. And one thing you find out when you do that is that there is an interrelationship between each part of the system. So say you use computational power to generate a structure that is as light as it can be while meeting all of the crash and other requirements. And you do that through simulations that are making trade-offs between different structures until you get that perfect structure, then you still need to print and assemble it. So you still need a machine, for example, to say, where do I split that uh, structure into which Lego blocks that can then be put in a print chamber and printed? You know, How do you maximize in their form the ability to pack those most densely in that print chamber, and at the same time, do it in a way that can be assembled in the right sequence. The same thing with materials. You need to create materials 
that have never existed as alloy formulations before so that they can both meet automotive requirements or exceed requirements so that you can design in new ways and yet still using, say, the laser power and other technology that you have, that you're able to print those materials. All of those things are uh, interrelated and take, you know, uh, take people, you know, openly cooperating and coordinating to, you know, build a, uh, to build a system. And so I'd say, you know, the, the main first principle thing is, you know, if you want to have a system, you have to start out, you know, architecting and designing it as a system. And I think that's what has uh, allowed us to create something new. That's what's allowed us to go from the typewriter to Mac desktop publishing for physical structures. Yeah. Lucas? Yeah, I think the systems approach is is really the first principle to it. And just highlighting a couple areas for, for you, Grant, and, and our listeners. Um, on the design side, for example, typically in auto, you would have um, traditional structures, CAD and FEA engineers that are using you know digital tools. They're on their computer designing these parts in 3D, but they're doing it in a very manual way. They might add you know some line architecture there, fill in a shape, run an analysis on it modify that shape slightly, run an analysis on it again. Um, what we've done on the design side is really paralyzed how, or put in parallel um, the design process. An AI-based generative design tool, which really just looks at what's the area the part can consume, what are the forces, the load cases we call in automotive that this part is going to take, what are the requirements in terms of you know, the energy it should absorb for crash or how stiff it should be for the vehicle length. We give it those attributes and that system quite literally adds and removes material and iterates and does the analysis in parallel until it converges on what we call a Pareto optimized design. So that design is the lightest possible design that still meets all those requirements. And those are hundreds of thousands of simulations that are happening. That's using, you know, high compute power uh, and that's ultimately allowing you to design something that, you know, would take a human team a decade to design or longer because they wouldn't reach that true Pareto optimization point. And designing that lighter structure is also very related to that sustainability point. If it's 30, 40 percent lighter because we've used that software tool, that means 30, 40 percent less material. So, you know, yeah. that's one highlight, the really front end of our uh, tool set, you could say here. And then the middle part is the manufacturing, right? Added manufacturing, 3D printing. That's replacing the casting or the stamping or the extrusions. And the great thing is you can create geometries that you can never cast. These are hollow structures. Sometimes it's a one millimeter wall thickness. And then the middle section of the part will have a complex gyroid lattice structure. And then some other part of the part will actually have a fluid channel that's conducting um, or doing fluid transfer of, of hydraulic fluid. And those are new geometries that you cannot create with any other manufacturing method. So 3D printing, you know, is the most advanced manufacturing method. It's a laser welding process, essentially. And it's allowing you to make these unique geometries. And then the last piece of our system, you know, to highlight our, our tool set here is fixtureless assembly. Once we've printed these parts, we don't want to weld them together. We don't want this old school automotive assembly line. So we create an assembly cell that quite literally can pick up any of these 3D printed parts and bond them into a final structure using laser radar for location, using 3D vision for monitoring, um, you know, joining and adhesive fill. And in the end, you have those three modules integrated in that system. And that allows you to make your first product in a fraction of the time that it would take you typically. It allows you to make a better product, 30, 40% lighter, stiffer, stronger, and it allows you to iterate much more quickly. If you want to change that vehicle design, if you want to absorb more energy in your crash case, that's a system that within you know, days or weeks can make that change instead of months or years, which is typical in the industry today. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, those are some incredible principles and make, makes a lot of sense how that, how that's had really all come together. Uh, it's interesting to me too, that, you know, really the, the automotive industry really, really took off, you know, with the um, in, invention of, of, of Ford's uh, assembly line. And now today in 2023, we're saying that, you know, maybe, maybe we don't need the assembly line. There's an even better way to do it. It sounds like. 
Well, after 100 plus years, you would hope that would be the case, right? Wouldn't you? Yeah, and, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And what, you know, what I would say is, you know, what Lucas touched upon as it relates to the environment, imagine you have, you know, large uh, companies that sell millions of vehicles and within a 10, 15 year period of time, across that entire vehicle fleet, you've reduced the mass, the material and energy required to build the vehicle and the efficiency of product by 20, 30% or more across an entire vehicle fleet. And wow. so when we're talking about uh, you know, digital design of these structures, to use an analogy, uh, if you look at the, the, you know, a beer can from 50 years ago, it required 83 grams of aluminum and almost none of it was recycled. It okay. had a very thick wall and a different tab. Today, when we buy a beer can, it's just as useful, but it has a different tab and a much thinner wall. It's reduced that 83 grams of aluminum required down to less than 13 grams. From 83 wow. to 13, while still having the same product usefulness, and almost all of it's recycled. So we looked and said, that's what you use computing power for. You add and subtract against all of those requirements in these simulations until you've used the minimum amount of material to meet your product requirement. So that's the dematerialization part that Lucas was talking about. So, you know, instead of consuming ever more material and energy, you know, you're making it more and more efficient, right? Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the use of material and energy, which in turn creates a more efficient product that uses less electricity for charging or, or fuel, uh, you know, to combust and, and propel the vehicle. And then the second thing is all of the materials that we've designed at the end of their life, they can be reatomized and printed as a new structure. So you want to, if you're going to have a sustainable manufacturing system, dematerialize and then close loop recycle everything. And that's also what digital design manufacturing and assembly enables. Wow. Wow. That, that's incredible. And, and, and not even limited. I mean, that, that's amazing to think when you think it, it, of, uh, you know, partners uh, with millions of vehicles and seeing those kind of uh, reductions in their um, uh, material requirements, I mean, is, is just amazing doing more with less. And as, as you've kind of alluded to already, too, it's, it's not even limited to just that. As, as incredible as that is, I mean, you're working, um, you know, with organizations um, uh, manufacturing drones, for example, and other methods of transportation and mobility. So if we can really apply, you know, some of these tools to all areas within transportation and, and mobility, the um, material savings uh, and uh, is, is going to be pretty incredible. Uh, it sounds like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, it, it's uh, so the 21 C and, and, and the vehicles uh, are, are, are also uh, incredible looking uh, just, just such a, an amazing design. I mean, it's, it's, it's striking um, just what a beautiful vehicle uh, that it is. Um, how, how much of that is a result of kind of this, this, these tools and this new process that you've developed? Um, I imagine a lot of collaboration, you know, from, from you and your design teams on just making something that looks really, really nice. Yeah. Can you maybe, you know, tell us how you've, uh, in addition to all of this, uh, created a, a, a vehicle that's, that's got Motor Trend and others just, uh, just, just leaving their jaw on the ground? Yeah, I'd say, you know, if you take the body of the 21C off and if you Google, you know, the 21C, you'll see the aluminum structures underneath. And those are very organic looking, almost like tendons of, a, you know, animal or human body, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Those are really designed fully using that AI generative design software. And those are fully optimized structures and they look natural because essentially that software is taking evolution and compressing it down into minutes. And that's why you're getting a shape that in some ways uh, is very akin to, to nature. Uh, the A surface of the car, and by that I mean the body of the vehicle, the way it appears with, with the body on, that's really guided by you know, our taste, our chief designer's taste, um, and you know, inspiration also from the SR-71 uh, fighter jet and inspiration from you know, some historic vehicles as well. 
and then very much so also um, form following function and really aerodynamics. So the aerodynamics of the 21C are exceptional. I'd say for a homologated vehicle, there's not another vehicle that has that um, lift to drag ratio that the 21C carries. And of course, that has to be well engineered and designed into your body. And what I'd say is our chief designer works very closely with our chief aerodynamicist because in the end, the A-surface body is a combination of both of those, the taste and the function. And at the price point we're selling, we tried to make a car and I think we succeeded. That was also elegant. That was going to be timeless. That 20 years from now, you'd look back and say, you know, those are purposeful, elegant lines uh, on the vehicle. So in the end, I think it's a very high tech vehicle. It's the highest performing vehicle in the world. But I do think we we also uh, do have a timeless design to the 21C. Very much so. Yeah, m- mission accomplished there. It, it is certainly timeless. It is certainly elegant. And uh, and, and congratulations, the, the, the highest tech, highest performing, uh, I would agree, most most beautiful, most elegant looking vehicle out there um, that, that, that's pretty incredible. So, so certainly congratulations, uh, on, on that. Um, I know that there's going to be a lot of audience members that a result of today's, you know, conversation and, and the education that each of you have uh, provided are going to be very excited to, to learn more about Divergent, to learn more about, uh, Zinger vehicles. Uh, would you mind maybe just, just sharing the website where, where individuals, companies can learn more about the incredible work that you're doing? Yeah. On the Zinger side, you know, www at zinger.com and for divergent www.divergent3d.com and what i'd say is there's also a wealth of um, published um, material on both companies especially on the zinger vehicles side there's actually a great jay leno uh, video on zinger vehicles where he's uh, driving the car at willow springs which is one of our local tracks we also on youtube have the track records at laguna seca and at Circuit of the Americas. So there's a a wealth of information. And then on the vehicle itself, as Kevin said, we're doing first deliveries this year. We've got 16 dealers across the globe. So most likely in your city, if you're living in in a major US city, you'll be able to go see a Zinger in person in a showroom uh, at one point in in the next year here. What I'd say is, I I, I know you probably have kind of an international audience. Yeah. You know, to me, Growing up in, in Cleveland, Ohio, you know, in a very blue collar family and then being able to, to get an education by being a very good football player in the first instance. Uh, I think this is a very American story and the way that Jay Leno put it, which is this is what happens when uh, American hot rodding evolves, when American hot rodders you know, go to university and get advanced degrees and actually start inventing. And it's that garage hot rodding spirit, like father and son building cars. When that meets, you know, the advanced knowledge world, then I think we see, you know, something very transformational. And I think there's a reason why that's uniquely happened in America. And I think will happen more and more in this century. Definitely so. But we're, we're, we're so proud and, and, and that's incredible. It, it is just an amazing American story. Um, and, and really what happens when, when just as you said, as, as Jay Leno said, when hot rodders kind of meet tech and, 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 and apply it all, th- this is the result of that. And it's, it's an incredible result. And again, just congratulations on just the, the amazing accomplishments in, in such a, a, a short period of, of time. And I know that myself and a lot of us out, out there are so excited to see one uh, in person, so excited to learn more about the companies and projects and uh, very excited too about what, what next uh, for the organization. So I know we'll, we'll all be watching closely, but, but thank you uh, both so much for, for taking the time to, to stop by and to talk within the Are We There Yet podcast. Uh, this has been um, uh, just really an incredible conversation, a dream conversation for me as someone that's uh, very passionate um, about uh, vehicles as well. So, so thank you both for taking the time to stop by. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Grant. And if you're ever in the LA area and uh, want to come and see like Westworld for cars, come and drop by and have your mind blown. Thank you so much. I'm, I, I'm going to make it happen. That sounds wonderful. Appreciate the invitation. Well, thank you all so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And again, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Grant. Thank you.